But what I'm here to talk about are buckets, specifically pond buckets. A cheap, simple, effective solution that looks good as well, complete with plants, a top-down experience. The second way you get to enjoy fish, the natural way to enjoy fish. In the past, our ancestors sat by a body of water and they were only able to view the fish from the top down. This is the old world style of fish keeping, a cathartic trip down memory lane, merely by just observing these fish from a bird's eye view. Just like early humans who may have enjoyed fish with only what they had, kind of like watching a VHS on a CRT television. Sometimes I like to think about Earth's first fish keepers and how they spent their time couldn't even see if the fish was sick from the side until glass was invented. Then the human race was able to get the coveted cross-section view of the fish. I've got these three bucket ponds going. These containers are from Home Depot, about $17. They hold a little over 50 quarts, which is roughly 10 gallons and some change. I use two to four inches of organic ground soil and two to three inches of quartz pool filter sand. I eventually ran out of the uh, white sand and had to switch to a play sand that appears a little more yellow in this one. I did not sift the wood pieces out of the soil. I have a cup of crushed coral in each bucket, so I'll be fine. Coral buffers up the pH and the KH. I don't pre-mix my dirt with water to make mud before the sand. I like to make it easy squeezy, lemon peasy. So if you're careful with your pour, you don't have to worry about floating dirt chunks. There is this caveat to my opinion, however, which is I have floaters with really long roots. And if I move those floaters, they're gonna pull a little bit of that dirt up. So I really don't register dirt popping through the sand anyways. Can the blind lead the blind? When you line like six to seven of these in a row and you do them one after another, the, the mud seems a little theatrical, a little dramatic. We're gonna make this as easy as possible so you can follow along at home. You just need to do a little fish lasagna, a layer of dirt, a cup of crushed coral, that's a special Brenton ingredient, a layer of sand, some well thought out aquascaping. Scratch the earth with God's shovels. My chosen style is shirtless on all fours, like an animal in 91 degree heat. These are the freedoms George Washington fought for. Oh look, I found a root, like some kind of truffle hog. Pat for good luck, a layer of plate, some water. Due to the physical nature of our world, when the dirt becomes wet, it's mud already. You don't need to get your fingies wet. The dirt doesn't float up unless you disturb it. So if that's the reason you're making mud pies, to keep from dirt interfering and appearing inside the sand, just be a little careful on this step and you won't have to wet the bucket twice. And if you just really enjoy the texture of mud flowing through your fingers, then please disregard this shortcut. And like I said before, I move the plants around a little too much for the dirt to never come up. I'm gonna use these ornaments I had laying around. Where were you when Rome fell? I'm currently awaiting my awards for aquascaping. They're in the mail. I'm trying to devise a winter plan now. I've got a dolly. I can drag all of these buckets into my garage. We could do a temporary greenhouse. A screened in back porch would be primo back here. A permanent greenhouse. Really come out here in my robe and get the water gardening done. I could try to leave them out when we only freeze once or twice a year. These hyacinth are blooming. You can really see the difference in the plants that are are taken on the fertilizer that's beneath the sand versus the one sitting in the pool without any substrate. I do want to move the tadpoles here. It gets 103 in this area and I'm thinking the sun comes up this way. So if I shade, if I keep these ponds shaded in the afternoon with either the fence or the umbrella, I think I can keep the fish safer. After trying the umbrella, 100 degrees went down to 90 and 85. I've been running out here with my temperature gun, getting little zap test here and there. And while I'm on the temperature gun, much better than thermometers. It's like the act of looking at a thermometer is already a full action and you might as well 
just point the gun and shoot. Look at one tiny little screen instead of looking at 56 little temperature stickers. Or even one of these godforsaken floating, non-floating, absolute scourge product of the fishing hobby, thermometer. Not only are these inaccurate, they're never turned the right way. The suction cups don't work. The ones that are supposed to sink float. The ones that are supposed to float sink. Really reminds me of an Easter egg hunt. Anytime you're curious about what temperature your tanks are, find the eggs. My point is, live by the laser gun, die by the laser gun. In retrospect, it was a happy coincidence this kiddie pool didn't boil. It's exposed in the morning, but shaded in the afternoon, so it got up to about 93 to 95, but never 103. I'm getting a little squeamish. The heat index and the heat advisories are higher than really I remember them ever being. All of these plants enjoy 72 degree weather inside the Garden of Eden, which is my house. The guppy grass doesn't like it. The frog bit doesn't like it, but the duckweed really doesn't like it. If you stay real quiet on a warm, sunny afternoon, you can actually hear the duckweed screaming. Here's my 5x5 grow tent, hot and humid. LED lights are a great example of a technology that's recently become a lot cheaper. They've always been around, but now they're a fourth of the price. They're about $25, $26. Sometimes they bounce up to $33, and I think that's when they get a big head. These are second only to the Mars Hydro, in popularity, at least. Regardless, for a fraction of the price, you can turn your living room into a sunny pasture. These will fulfill any lighting requirements. They do still produce heat, like the old ones, but it's a fraction of the electricity. The heat production is minuscule. In the past, whenever I needed the power of the sun, I would forego LEDs and I would use HPS lights. Now LEDs are so cheap. I thought maybe these lithium battery solar power panels would be the next step into fish keeping. This is not true. This little thing comes with a bunch of caveats. One of them is they don't keep these pumps running 24 seven with one day of recharge. So that's a no go. The battery is pretty hilarious too. If you look closely at the directions, it tells you not to put it in the hot sun. I wonder what other sun you could put it in besides the hot one. Also, we've got these little air pumps that look like a good deal. You can even get them a couple of dollars cheaper off of Amazon as opposed to Aquarium Co-op. The kind of garbage though, you get them rained on exactly one time and they just quit working. If you do get these, I guess just don't let them outside, which defeats the purpose. The little aquarium co-op mock air pumps are absolute garbage. The little solar panel was garbage. Maybe emergency use, but not constant use. It doesn't recharge quick enough. The ports start rusting. The little air pumps act out on you. They imply that they're meant to be used outside. And then as soon as they get rained on, they start crapping out on you. And so we've got a regular pump inside an upside down trash can. So this is how I avoid my system getting wet. I use a trash can with a pot right over it. And it is a little cocoon that's rainproof. So to recap, the lithium batteries are garbage. The aquarium co-op copycat pumps are also garbage when they get rained on. I can't speak for the official aquarium co-op pumps, but they look like they're built the same. But here is the trash can flower pot cocoon. It got rained on, but it is completely dry and ready for service. One thing I don't have a shortage of is dirty filters and dirty sponges. It is the secret ingredient turn a clean tank into a green tank. I went absolute squid mode on these ponds. They needed to be seeded with bacteria. The need for the seed. So I used one of these sponges, gave it a few clean squeezes, and this should charge up the cycling process by at least two weeks. I had the sponge filter working on two of these. The other one didn't have bubbles running through it. This is what they look like a day later. This pond actually looks a lot different than the other two with the filter. Using this trick to jumpstart the bacteria colony, it's almost like having plant cuttings. You never really have to grow from a seed if you've already got somewhere to start from. It's like downloading a free plant. I don't keep any fish here. 
but I do keep a water pump. It's a tiny little water park. It is time to crest in each pond with a hideaway cave. To save money, I'm going to use these little decorations I've had laying around. Whenever there's a shadow that stresses out my little fish, they will slip into these caves. We've got the mini T-Rex skull, E2 Brute. We have some Goonie Caves, maybe Mount Rushmore for Skeletor. There you go. And we've got Mumbo Jumbo's hut. I've put floaters in here to relax the fish. Each bucket has a floater. The Brazilian water weed looks a little sun stressed, so I've tried to put the frog bit on top of it. The water spangles and the water lettuce get along great. They're like the Bash Brothers. To turn this game around. Absolutely bullying the duckweed wherever it goes. And they're, they, it's almost like they're ready to push the duckweed right out of the tank. This was kind of an experiment. I wanted to see how each floating plant interacts with each other. One thing is I got a lot of frog bit right on top of this bucket. This frog bit comes preloaded with aphids all ready for the outdoors. For some reason, they haven't moved on to my other tanks with frog bit. I'm thankful. They're really attracted to water poppy and medium attracted to frog bit and hyacinth. I almost poured right over these uh, friendly neighborhood aphids, enjoying their Sunday picnic. After their episode with me indoors, I just can't resist not giving them a hug. They're having their Lunchables. And now, they're having their crunchables. I've been keeping a close eye on the aphid activity in these ponds. What I've noticed is it seems like the ants, even the fire ants, they scurry on top of the pads. And I think they take the aphids home as pets if Bugs Life has any accuracy to it. Isn't that right, aphid? Oh, you're such a cute little aphid. The water poppy always takes a little while to show its appreciation, but eventually it started going wild out here. I was able to split it in three pieces. The hyacinth is clapping its feet and giggling out here. So, you know, high five hyacinth. It's Florida man tip time. Use the fan and the mosquitoes will not land. The real light like kites and as they're coming in for your blood, they'll get blown away by your mini hurricane. <laughs> Hang a paper bag to make the wasp move out. Makes them think there's bigger, tougher, meaner wasp right up the street. Do yourself a favor and harness the conditions to throw yourself a perfect night pond party. Here are the six ponds in all their glory. All nice and grown in. Got the water poppy with uh, water spangles and the frog bit. Like we've got. Okay, got some plants on there. Pennywort, is that what it's called? Inside here we've got purple dragon guppies. These came from the indoors and I was a little afraid of how they would adapt out here but they're doing absolutely fine. A lot better than the sore tails. I would say do not put sore tails outside if you are in zone eight. Oh my gosh, this one just jumped out of the water at me. I'll go ahead and give these guys some num nums so they'll have something to do with me. I think they're a lot happier outside. They sat there in about 78 degrees inside the tanks, keep it a little cooler thinking that the males will pester the females a little bit less but when i moved them out here and the temperature's like mid 80s 85 degrees uh, they seem to be a lot more healthy a lot more active they're all over the place i'm seeing less rips in the tails it really makes me think that i need to start bringing my tanks up to 82 or 84 degrees inside this is the tank that I put sword tails in. It was about 88 degrees when they landed. And uh, don't do that. Don't do that in zone eight. Guppies, rice fish, mosquito fish, go ahead and put them outside. Do not put your sword tails outside. They all had curved tails. I lost one, I pulled them all out with some salt baths. I got all of them rejuvenated. 
uh, wish I had that piece of information before. You know, if you do a quick, quick Google search, I, it, they'll just, they'll tell you two different things. They're like, oh, it's great. Also be careful. And that's the first red flag, I guess. If you're over here in zone eight or lower, be careful means don't put them outside. And then the plants under here, it just seems like they do a lot better when I leave them alone. I'll even let the algae grow, it uh, balances the water. I think this is a Taiwan lily, but more water poppy, water lettuce, water spangles. I love how they separate on their own. And inside this one, oh, I see a fry. We've actually got babies in this one. That was the first time I've seen a baby, which means they're hatching. If we get their attention, these guys are friendly. You could see the uh, Mexican oak leaf actually coming out of the water and adapting to the emerge style. There we go. Koi rice fish. Expensive little buggers. Doing very well outside. These guys were like $12 a piece. That's about the comfort range for me spending money. Now this one is the assorted guppies. There's just frog bit. And the frog bit seems to be having a time. The only thing I can think is the Brazilian water weed inside here. There's a lot of it. They must be uh, sucking all the nutrients first. Oh, I'll drop a sweat right in there. I'm sorry, guys. There's a little salt. But assorted guppies. I grabbed all of my assorted guppies and I put them out here. And they are chilling. After a day of being shocked. In this first pond, we have the water wisteria. We've got pearl weed, a little bit of hair algae. Both of those are doing surprisingly well out here. These are the blue rice fish. Happy little buggers. They're a little creeped out that I uh, took the hyacinth out of this. I've got the, uh, the hyacinth plants in a, another container right now, and I'm treating them for a, uh, a blight, a hyacinth specific blight. I'll put the text on the screen. Pro other plants are probably affected, but uh, neem oil is what I treated them with, and the neem oil will affect the fish. Now that I'm seeing this fry from those other ri rice fish, though, I'm really wondering if we got fry in this one. I hope I didn't pull any eggs out. If I did pull some eggs out, I feel like I would see the fry by now. And we don't. They do look a little bit better. So my suspicions were correct. We do have fry. feed them a little bit. All of these containers have fry in it. Been very shocked how quickly the rice fish breed, how quickly the eggs hatched. Got a little Sorla pump air pump just in case. They've already gotten a lot bigger, but man, they are tiny. All right, and this is just all frog bed. Couple of hyacinth. These are midnight rice fish. They're also pretty friendly, so I can get them to come up. They're midnight black. So with the white sand, or the lighter sand, you can almost 
see them. This is early in the morning. I'm already sweating into these ponds. Or it's it's not even it's not even 10:30 yet. Oh, there we go. There's one hanging in the roots. We are not going to see these guys. At a glance though, you could see, you know, the dwarf and the spangles. I'm not sure why they, the spangles are a different color than the rest of these. There must be some kind of nutrient balance. Let's we'll see if we can find these guys. Got an Amazon sword down there in the middle. Got crystal wart in here. No, we're not gonna see them. They are just a little silver flash. And they are so freaked out every time I peek in here that I really keep it at a minimum. I will put them on the screen though. Daisy's rice fish. I feel like they became a thing. They were just discovered in 2006. I did find fry from Daisy's rice fish, so I'm, I'm assuming these guys are thriving. Sometimes catch them eating. Well, try again next time. And then we've got a cherry laurel, laurel cherry, a Carolina laurel cherry. This tree right here, and then this tree is a Indian laurel, and both of them aren't great for fish. So, so I'm not sure if I need to move my ponds. I do pick leaves out of here on the daily. I really trimmed back these two laurels, hopefully to minimize the leaves coming into the fish pool for now. They're not completely to toxic categorized under slightly toxic, I believe. These leaves do fall in every once in a while and that's when the ram's horn snails come in. Any leaf that turns black in here, I can just see it getting gobbled up by snails. Just hanging out. All right, now that these have been Nice and frazzled. And now that I found fry, guess I'll leave them alone, let them just sit. I've been not mowing my yard so I can see what plants come up, which ones I can identify. This zone is kind of wretched where it seems like it's warm most of the time. The winters are pretty bitter, so it keeps anything from really growing in terms of like tropical plants or anything that looks interesting. This is kind of what I'm familiar with locally. It's a kind of has a raggedy look to it. I swear all the local plants really have like a, a raggedy look to them. I guess they've got to be scruffy because these hard winters come in and uh, and then the hard summers come in. They've got to be able to withstand extreme temperatures. And you might say, oh look, a hibiscus, so pretty. This thing does well outside. Yeah, when it's not winter. This thing will be sitting in the garage with the fish ponds when winter comes. Actually, all of these plants will be. These do not do well in zone 8A winter. Since the ponds have been in, I've noticed a bloom of wildlife. There's always lizards, different types of frogs. I've seen more skinks than ever. Just as long as alligators don't come up, I can deal with snakes as long as it's not a copperhead, a rattlesnake, or a black moccasin. I'd be quite unhappy if a alligator popped out of one of these buckets. I don't think the ponds are big enough. That's one way to get your solar UV rays. He knows it's a hot spot. And there you have it. This has been another episode of Britain's Fish. Thank you for liking, subscribing, commenting. I read those still. Until next time, fish keepers.
until next time.